I'm really delighted to introduce Grace Hong, who is Professor of Gender Studies and Asian American Studies at UCLA. Professor Hong is the author of The Ruptures of American Capital, Women of Color Feminism and the Cultures of Immigrant Labor, published by the University of Minnesota Press in 2006. Death Beyond Disavowal, The Impossible Politics of Difference, University of Minnesota Press um, 2015, which won the Association for Asian American Studies Cultural Studies Book Prize. And she is the co-editor with Roderick Ferguson of Strange Affinities, The Gender and Sexual Politics of Comparative Racialization, which was published by Duke University Press in 2011. And over the last 20 years, she's been concerned to study the gender division of labor of racialized immigrant laborers under US capitalism in the 20th century. Her work describes the racial and gendered contradictions of US political economy in the transition from national industrial capitalism to deindustrialized global capitalism to what we now call neoliberal finance capitalism. And she attends especially to comparative racialization or the linked yet differentiated impacts on black, indigenous, and immigrant communities in relation to those shifts. It's also, her work is also concerned to consider Asian American communities in a global frame that includes racialization within the United States, as well as racialization within US militarism and US empire in Asia. Moreover, she considers women of color feminism and women of color expressive culture as the crucial resource for the critical analysis of global capitalism, as both the explanation for and the alternative to the violence and impoverishments of our current conditions. She's helped us to understand women of color not as a category of identity, but one that is built through acknowledging and working through differences. Her work has helped us envision a politics not premised on the suppression of differences, but on grappling with differentiated related histories of racial enslavement, dispossession, enclosure, and exclusion. More importantly, Grace exemplifies these ideas in her lived commitments as a colleague, teacher, mentor, and activist. We're grateful to have her share her current work on Gina Kim's virtual reality film, Bloodless, Dong Du Chan. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Grace Kim Won Hong. Um, so is this on now? That's for the camera. The podium mic should be on. Oh, I see. Got it. Um, Oh, um, okay, well, um, everyone can hear me, yeah? Okay, great. Um, so, um, you know, many thanks to you all for being here. Um, and of course, um, you know, thanks to Lisa um, for organizing this talk, as well as a, just a really engaging uh, visit to her graduate seminar yesterday. Um, you know, many thanks to uh, Leah Mericor for um, inviting me to participate in her graduate seminar today. Um, and it's just been this, you know, um, really amazing opportunity um, to engage with um, old friends and new um, that I am very, very grateful for. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> so um, my presentation today is on um, Gina Kim's uh, um, uh, on um, Korean diasporic filmmaker Gina Kim's um, Bloodless, or uh, in Korean, um, Dongducheon, um, a 12-minute non-narrative virtual reality film shot in the camp town, or in Korean, the Kijicheon, of Dongducheon near the US military bases Camp Casey and Camp Hovey. Um, and, and those are about 40 miles outside of Seoul, South Korea. So just, you know, really quickly. So in English, the title is Bloodless. Um, in Korean, it's Dongducheon, and Dongducheon does not mean bloodless. It's the name of the camp town. Um, so while the explicit aim of the film is to engage the conditions of camp town life and death, and in particular, to recall the brutal murder of one particular camp town sex worker, it does so in ways that are deeply ambivalent about the logics of historical recovery 
and narrative coherence as a means of redressing historical and contemporary violence. Instead, Bloodless mobilizes a temporality of contingency and an aesthetics of perceptual uncertainty in order to challenge rather than enhance um, the assumption of verisimilitude and transparency, in other words, the reality of virtual reality. So um, it does so out of a desire for activation without recourse to recognition, uh, you know, and, and the recognition must be evaded if we are to conjure up the long disavowed histories of neo-colonial violence in the specific context of present day US empire. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, Kim, who teaches at my institution, UCLA, um, in the School of Theater, Film, and Television is a much lauded director whose work encompasses both award-winning experimental and documentary films and commercially successful feature films. So her last feature film, Final Recipe, um, <laughs> starred Michelle Yeoh and featured um, Korean-Canadian K-pop artist uh, Henry Lau um, as a young man who enters a cooking contest to try to save his grandfather's failing restaurant. Um, it opened in over 3,000 theaters in Asia. Um, you can watch it on Netflix. <laughs> um, so <laughs> representing a departure from Final Recipe, uh, to put it mildly, um, Bloodless is Kim's first foray into virtual reality filmmaking and is also anomalous within her oeuvre in that it is arguably her uh, most um, overtly political film today. So as Bloodless requires a VR headgear and special seating, um, it has mainly screen screened at film festivals, museums, and universities. Um, it has gathered much acclaim on the film festival circuit where independently produced VR films have flourished of late. Um, and um, Bloodless um, has won several best VR film awards at these film festivals. It also screened at the Seoul International Women's Film Festival in the summer of 2018 where um, uh, w which was the first time it reached a largely South Korean viewership. So, um, Bloodless is a hybrid film that blends together documentary and fictionalized elements in order to depict the last hours of the life of Yoon Kumi, um, a sex worker in Dongducheon who was tortured, raped, and murdered in 1992 um, by Kenneth Lee Markle, um, a U.S. Army medic. Because of the extreme brutality of the crime, alongside a growing culture of social protest in the wake of the student democracy movements against military dictatorship, which, trans in, uh, which, which ushered in a transition into democratic governance in 1987, Yun's murder sparked a sustained campaign that led to the subsequent arrest and trial of her murderer. Uh, Korean and international feminists and anti-US military activists were galvanized by this event, and it was largely due to their if, um, efforts that Mar um, Marco was tried and convicted in Korean courts rather than by the US military, uh, which was a first at the time. So Marco was sentenced to 15 years, which he served in a Korean prison and was released in 2006. Um, so Kim, who was a college student in 1992, narrates her politicization and identity as a feminist as inaugurated by the organizing around Yun's murder. Um, she has also discussed um, her many attempts to make a film about Yun over the decades um, you know, since um, this politicization, um, attempts which always um, stalled until she hit upon the medium of VR. So, while Markle's case may have seemed to signal South Korea's defiance of their usual relationship of subservience to U.S. military interests, such a reading must be contextualized within the decades-long history of U.S. neocolonialism in the region. This relationship has shaped much of South Korean society, politics, and economy in the post-World War II era, but, uh, but both South Korean and U.S. national cultures have ambivalently narrated and more often disavowed this conjoined history, particularly in relation to military sex work. While the so-called comfort women who were co coerced into sexual slavery by Japanese colonial forces during World War II are perhaps the most well-known example, militarized sex work has long been a fact of life, a key economic driver, 
um, and a political necessity in South Korea. As Catherine Moon has noted, sex work is the, quote, raison d'etre of the Kijichon, end quote. And there is a camp town near every US military base in South Korea, which has seen continuous US military presence since 1945. Uh, while sex work is technically illegal under South Korean law, it has always been tacitly encouraged. Um, while officially South Korean citizens, military sex workers have been regulated not uh, by not only the South Korean state, um, but by the US military, which has colluded to subject them to invasive STD checks and um, has turned a blind eye um, to conditions of near um, indentured servitude and to systemic abuse and violence at the hands of their clients. Um, as such, Jody Kim has argued that the uh, Camp Town is a deathly space, one in which overlapping sovereignties, South Korean and US, create a necropolitical state of precarity protected by neither state that thus leaves residents constantly vulnerable to death. The Camp Town sex worker, necessary but disavowed, was for a long time unable to be murdered or mourned because her life was never protectable in the first place. So this is a historical backdrop to Yen's case, which was unusual not because camp town sex workers um, had previously not been subjected to extreme violence, but because there was such widespread outrage about what had um, been by that point, a decades long situation ignored or excused by both the populace at large um, and by the South Korean state. While Yen's death uh, became what Grace Cho calls, quote, a transnational macro spectacle, end quote, she writes that its atypical hypervisibility provides no more agency to Yan, nor does it give us um, any more access to her than does the invisibility um, of the uncountable unmourned. Cho refuses to frame the widespread recognition of Yan's murder through a redemptive narrative of justice um, brought about, you know, for example, by the South Korean state's you know, successful conviction and punishment of Markle. At the same time, Cho also refuses to foreclose the possibilities of other more inchoate manifestations of agency. For Cho, Yun's death um, is a form of spectral haunting. She writes that, quote, um, in its travels, it haunted the imaginations of Korean feminists as well as anti-US activists on the peninsula, end quote. Um, you know, and Gina Kim, you know, explicitly counts herself amongst these Korean feminists um, for which state justice is no resolution. As Cho reminds us, quote, the ghosts have an agency of their own, end quote. In this context, the question um, is how to raise histories of violence without subjecting these histories to the desire for resolution and reparations that as um, Lisa Yonayama um, compellingly argues undergirds um, US empire. Um, so, um, you know, um, haunting is perhaps the only adequate rejoinder to the particularities of a specifically neoliberal manifestation of US empire, in which an imperial self-critique ends up legitimating rather than undermining its imperial ambitions. Um, so in Cold War ruin, Ruins, Yonayama notes that the hallmark of, post -World War, um, of the post-World War II era is the conundrum that the very idea of recognition and remedy for historical justice, uh, injustices replicates the violences of US militarism and hides the tracks of present day US empire. So Yonayama calls this, quote, the Americanization of post 1990s redress and reparations. So for instance, um, Yonayama argues that the vision of the United States is a benevolent force disseminating democracy through, uh, throughout the, US, uh, the Asia Pacific region is supported in large part through its purported ability to both punish war, uh, Japanese war crimes and to reckon with its own um, uh, legacies of wartime violence. So um, likewise, Nita Tanasoski observes the ways in which cinematic and literary narratives of the Vietnam War encouraged US um, audiences to understand themselves and US foreign policy uh, by extension as moral precisely because they engaged in self-critique of the violence and devastation wrought on Vietnamese lives. Thus, the very notion that the violence of war can be redressed 
um, is itself an important aspect of U.S. post-war hegemony. Um, what we'll find in Bloodless, however, is that in the realm of the haunted and the ghostly, recognition or redress are deeply irrelevant. As such, um, Bloodless refuses recognition, um, and it does so um, that um, through um, the mobilization of aesthetics and form that departs from VR's conventional applications. Uh, these conventional applications have been, um, in a twist of appropriate irony, innovated by the U.S. military. So while we uh, may more readily associate VR technology with gaming, uh, the earliest driver of virtual reality technology development was the U.S. military. So the U.S. Uh, uh, so the U.S. military developed VR for use um, uh, as train in training simulations um, and um, as uh, um, and as therapies uh, for veterans suffering from PTSD. Um, so in other words, uh, before and after actual insertion in war. So the military's use of VR technologies in both contexts, um, and in particular, um, uh, its um, uh, emphasis on um, the importance of um, VR's verisimilitude, um, has been fertile ground for its self-narration as ethical and humanitarian. Um, so, um, and, and so this is um, an example of the therapeutic uses of VR. This is, um, uh, which I'll talk about in a, in a second. Um, so, um, all right. Um, an early VR innovator and the main producer of VR technologies for use by the military is the Institute for Creative Technologies, ICT, at the University of Southern California, um, an elite private school located across town from my institution. Um, <laughs> ICT was founded in 1999. So, I mean, you think about like 1999, that was like so early for VR, right? Um, through a $45 million grant um, from the U.S. Department of Defense, the DOD. Um, so international security theorist James Dragerian identifies the establishment of ICT as the inauguration of what he calls the, um, quote, military industrial media entertainment network, end quote, to which I'd add the university as a non-incidental uh, non institutional partner. Um, and, and he has this really interesting sort of um, theorization of the ways in which, you know, um, L.A. was really important because of um, access to sort of media industries, um, which was necessary for, you know, doing all this VR work. Uh, so ICT has developed several VR technologies in conjunction with the DOD, um, including a training um, program called Flat World um, from 2001 to 2007. Um, and a PTSD uh, treatment program called Brave Mind, um, 2005 uh, to, to, uh, to the present, it's um, actually still being used, uh, which has created, um, uh, so Brave Mind is the project um, which uh, created the VR exposure based treatment program called Virtual Iraq, and then later renamed Virtual Iraq and Afghanistan, which are just like, and then like virtual Syria, virtual Yemen. I mean, you just can just keep going on and on and on. So, um, so uh, okay, in any case, <laughs> um, so these early VR projects, Flat World and Brave Mind, engage temporalities um, of, um, oops, let me go back engage temporalities of resolution and the aesthetics of verisimilitude to advanced individual, individuated biologistic decontextualized and ahistorical definitions of agency and trauma, and in so doing replicated the notion of the military as a humanitarian and ethical endeavor. So VR's supposed ca uh, capacity for realism and verisimilitude becomes central to this narrative of ethicality. So new media scholar Lucy uh, Suchman's analysis of Flat World uh, demonstrates that for the military, its efficacy is based on its capacity for verisimilitude, and thus any narratives about Flat World uh, must elide any of the inevitable breaks or discontinuities between the virtual and the, and, and the actual. Um, this framing of VR provides the specific uh, ideological legitimations uh, required by the strategic and ethical dilemmas um, of the, you know, quote unquote, war on terror. 
that is, as commonly observed, the war on terror is not fought in conventional ways, you know, with a clear battlefield on which two forces confront each other, um, but is um, instead fought through occupation and insurgency. So in this context, who is the enemy and whom the beneficiary of US military protection can be difficult, if not impossible, to delineate, mainly because occupation uh, sort of necessarily means that everyone is suspect. So the use of VR technologies allows the military to obfuscate this condition by asserting the possibility um, of discerning between enemy and ally. So Suchman recounts that in 2006, um, a flat world VR technology was incorporated into the um, Marines Infantry Immersion Trainer uh, built in Camp Pendleton, California, located about 50 miles north of San Diego. So um, the IIT was a hybrid installation which mixed built environments, live action actors, um, and VR technologies to quote unquote fully immerse pre-deployment Marines in a reconstructed Iraqi village in order to present them with ostensibly hyper-realistic combat situations. So Marines uh, performed house searches under conditions that mimicked um, the noise, smell, heat, and chaos of combat and were presented with scenarios um, involving figures marked as insurgents as opposed to those uh, marked as civilians, that is, women and children, uh, during which they were called upon to make snap decisions about uh, when to fire and whom to fire upon. So, um, it, you know, it's obviously kind of the gamification of this kind of training, which is, um, you know, really interesting to think about also. Um, such simulations are purported to enhance ethical decision making. Central um, to these claims is VR technology's ability to faithfully recreate combat conditions so as to inoculate military personnel to the stresses of combat. So Suchman observes that despite the many lapses in VR technology that undermined the suspension of disbelief, um, you know, and it was in 2006 and, you know, like obviously the VR doesn't look that great. <laughs> <clears throat> um, as well as the inherent contradictions of a training that purported simultaneously to, quote, sharpen combat instincts and reinforce ethical conduct, end quote. So despite all of these lapses, both uh, the command structure and the Marines who participated in the trainings emphasized IIT's fidelity to field conditions as a signal of its effectiveness. Uh, VR's fully immersive quality and its supposed verisimilitude, in other words, buoys um, a technological utopianism that legitimates U.S. military violence um, by making Marines more discriminate, uh, discriminating in their killing and by creating and reinforcing distinctions between dangerous insurgents and innocent civilians. So put um, another way, in implying that Flat World and IIT can produce ethical soldiers, it re uh, represents the moral failings of war um, as limited to individual mistakes of judgments rather than as a fundamental condition of war itself. So um, a second military application of VR, um, the Brave Mind Project's virtual um, Iraq program, likewise emphasizes narratives of verisimilitude, this time in VR's clinical application, uh, particularly as a way to delineate the relationship between war trauma and memory. So virtual Iraq uh, began as uh, recycled visual and graphic elements from a simulation training program much like Flat World. Virtual Iraq was later, um, uh, speaking of gamification, uh, released as a commercial first-person shooter video game called Full Spectrum Warrior, and that was in 2004. Um, so Virtual Iraq is a PTSD treatment protocol um, that replicates traumatic events experienced by military personnel uh, suffering from this clinical condition um, that has uh, been called, quote, a disorder of time. Patients are fitted with a VR headset and headphones um, and stand on a podium that mimics uh, the kinetic, uh, yeah, um, I thought I had a photo of it, um, that mimics the kinetic sensations of explosions. So you're like on a platform and as you're like watching the VR, like the platform will shake when an explosion goes off in the distance. Um, they're also outfitted with controllers that, um, that hyper-realistically mimic weaponry such as a rifle. 
So although the clinical rationale behind um, this form of treatment uh, predates the advent of VR technology, the incorporation of VR enables the fantasy of an ever more um, effective cure for the violences of war. Um, so um, the, this clinical rationale um, has been termed exposure-based treatment, and um, it hypothesizes that PTSD symptoms can be ameliorated by guiding patients to remember repeatedly the traumatic event in detail, habituating them to the experience. The thought is that over time and with repeated exposure, the traumatized involuntary emotional reactions eventually abate, rendering the memory less debilitating. And this is a very biologistic sort of neuroscientific approach to PTSD. So, um, <clears throat> Um, so adding VR technology to this exercise, so you can do it without VR, right? So what you do is you just kind of like recount the experience and describe it over and over again to your therapist. Um, but um, adding VR technology to this exercise is um, thought to make these memories more realistic um, and detailed. And further, because the clinician has full control of what happens in the simulation, VR um, disables the patient's psychic defense mechanisms, um, the repression of these traumatic memories, for example, or other tactics of avoidance. So the military's clinical uses of VR technology operate on the logic of habituation, or in other words, the retraining of brain and nervous system functions um, in ways that um, place emphasis on psychobiology. Uh, new media theorist uh, Pasi uh, Valiajo notes that exposure-based therapy relies on the notion that PTSD is an in inappropriate manifestation of like brain and nervous system biology rather than predicated on a narratological basis of subjectivity. So while Valiajo does not state so explicitly, this approach to PTSD, um, you know, obviously departs from earlier definitions of trauma descended from psychoanalytic frameworks, which define trauma as um, a breakdown in the psyche's ability to narrativize and thus assimilate an event into um, a coherent narrative of the self. So rather, exposure-based therapy posits that PTSD um, is caused by the brain and nervous system's instinctual responses to danger um, as an important survival mechanism that glitches um, when it's triggered, even when the organism is not actually in physical peril. So PTSD treatments such as virtual Iraq ostensibly work by changing physiological reactions to traumatic memory um, by, in effect, retraining the brain and its autonomic central nervous system functions. So the narrative contours of the memory itself um, is then not necessarily under manipulation, but the patient's uh, physiological and affective re um, reactions. The therapist's task then is to treat PTSD as a series of responses to stimuli, rather than to frame it as an embodied and sublated mediation of war. Um, the uh, temporality of trauma in which past experience is unrepresentable but palpably felt in the present is reduced to an individual disorder of physiology that can be managed by being subsumed into a linear temporality of illness and cure. So while Valiajo is critical of these you know, VR uses of technology, he, re uh, he uh, replicates the decontextualization and bio biologist side Bio, biologicization inherent to medical discourses in that he uncritically takes up the notion that VR operates simply um, on the brain and nervous system uh, with the actual sort of content of these images, much less the context being somewhat in, irre irrelevant. Um, in contrast, Bloodless highlights the colonial, gendered, and sexualized nature of the violence that war and militarism inflicts not only or even centrally on the soldiers who turn the violence on themselves, um, you know, through PTSD um, as a manifestation of what Valiajo terms neoliberal autoimmunity, but on so-called enemy populations. And very often, um, you know, the violence is also against the allies that U.S. militarism is supposed to protect, right? The experience of bloodless, in contrast, is to scramble VR's uh, mobilization of verisimilitude to provoke feelings of alienation and spectral embodiment. So bloodless works to connect 
embodied an affective experience and narrative um, and imagistic content in order to make resident, resonant the violence of camp town life and death. Rather than understand trauma as an individuated embodied response to violent conditions, the film references trauma as a historical event. And so here I want to return to Grace Cho's work because I find Cho's um, understanding of trauma very instructive. So her framework understands trauma um, as a response to violence rendered unnarratable. Trauma is, quote, the excess that escapes symbolization, end quote. Um, this unnarratability occurs not simply because of a patient's inability to create a coherent narrative out of the experience of violence or because of a glitch in the patient's autonomic systems, but because the memory of violence is foreclosed multiply as a function of an historical and political erasure. For Cho, the quote, fabric of erasure, end quote, is woven from the shame of unequal power relations between South Korea and the US, which requires that South Korea be grateful for US militarism and neocolonialism, despite the massive toll that such relations take. This toll, Cho argues, um, is most emblematically represented, but also um, disavowed um, in the figure of the military sex worker um, slash military bride referenced uh, by the derogatory epithet Yang Gongju, which is itself a figure that represents the quote, spectral force that made visible the continuing traumas of US military domination, end quote. The Yang Gongju is not an anomalous figure then, but one that epitomizes the condition of South Koreans, Korean migrants, and Korean Americans uh, for whom assimilation to U.S. narratives of benevolence and salvation um, is both requisite and violent. Even more broadly, the structure of forgetting that Cho describes is not limited to the Korean condition. Rather, quote, the forgotten war is also a metaphor for a hegemony that depends on not seeing the violences that have created its ghosts, end quote. Thus, if the military's use of VR is predicated on the notion that this technology gives us increasingly truthful and realistic modes of seeing and recalling, Cho argues that this very claim to omniscience creates the structure of erasure. So Cho suggests that trauma's disorganization of narrative means that it does exist on an embodied um, kinesthetic um, and affective register so unlike the epistemological framework of exposure therapy predicated on um, physiology, however, Cho's deployment of the concept of synesthesia allows for an understanding of traumas operating on a historical as opposed to only on an individual register. Um, Cho writes, quote, when the subject cannot speak her own history, when history is um, unintelligible or made unintelligible, who or what speaks for her. The thing that cannot directly be spoken becomes the phantom that works like a ventriloquist, like a stranger within the subject's own mental topography, end quote. So uh, when Cho references, you know, the subject who cannot speak her own history, she is in part referencing the Yang Gongju, um, the Camp Town sex worker. So in the case of Bloodless, that would be, you know, kind of literally Yun Kumi. However, if we take Cho's argument that the Yang Gongju is a figure for all those who wrestle um, with this hegemony that depends on not seeing the violences that have created its ghosts, um, all those who are foreclosed from knowing the past because of the erasures of the present, we might also think of the filmmaker and the viewer as likewise animated or haunted by these traumas of historical violence. Mm -hmm. So, um, so um, I'm going to show the bloodless um, trailer, um, but um, I want to sort of um, put a caveat. So um, unlike, you know, um, regular film, um, you know, VR film, like you can't just clip it and show it obviously, right? You need the whole like setup. 
Um, so the only thing I can show you is this trailer, but this trailer is very non-representative because it's not even a clip, right? It's a trailer. Um, and so um, it has uh, music um, on it, which the film does not have. Um, and it's sort of just these clips, but at least you can sort of, s sort of see the general aesthetic and, and the kind of um, evocative nature of this film. So. Sorry, sorry about all this flickering. Let me um, put this back up. Um, so I wonder actually if I can, I'm sorry, get it to just be in that spot where um, we can see her face. Yeah, there we go. Oh, I keep missing it. Oh, okay. You know what? Let me just not um, fuss with it. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, okay, so, um, so uh, Bloodless disorganizes any sense of a progressive temporality of resolution and undermines the suspension of disbelief that en enables um, the presence of um, uh, the pretense of verisimilitude. So uh, Bloodless begins with shots of the actual camp down of Dongdu Chen, which is like still an active camp town, uh, in daylight. So the first scene is of a stray dog sta uh, standing in the corner of an alley, while useful, useful for technical orientation, right? So the assistant who was helping me with the VR headset and everything uh, asks me um, to let him know when I see the dog so that he knows that the film has started correctly. <laughs> Um, so the viewer's sudden placement in this scene immediately establishes both the feelings of disorientation and of strange quiet intimacy that pervade this film. Um, the streets are only lightly inhabited. A Korean man bikes past seemingly unaware of the camera. A ragged cut and two U.S. Army soldiers in t-shirts, camouflage pants and boots walk past. Um, eyeing the camera with curiosity, or perhaps suspicion, or um, perhaps the self-consciousness of being filmed, while entering what looks like a club. So eventually, the film cuts to a scene at night of a dark, empty street. Before we see her, we hear the footsteps of a woman walking in high heels. The solitary figure of Yun, played by an actress, wearing a mini dress, hose, and an oversized army jacket draped over her shoulders, walks into the frame. Uh, the camera follows her as she walks, alone and nonchalant, after a presumable night in the clubs. The streets um, and alleyways are empty, the businesses are shuttered, and the sound of her heels echo off the buildings. Throughout, Yen is staged and performed as neither vulnerable nor particularly agential, she walks um, unhurriedly uh, through the streets. Her clothing references her occupation as a bar girl, um, but she is not framed by the camera in a particularly sexualized manner, and her embodiment and uh, movement is ordinary and prosaic. Yet this literal description um, and this you know, conventional uh, film trailer um, cannot fully convey the experience of the film. Bloodless is experienced through a VR headset and headphones um, with the viewer um, uh, seated in a rotating desk, desk chair. <laughs> I actually think she just put everyone in a desk chair so we wouldn't like fall over and hurt ourselves. <laughs> um, but um, uh, once in the headset, the viewer has a 360 degree view of the scene on every axis. 
while the term virtual reality conjures the idea of a fully immersive experience that ostensibly feels more lifelike than other cinematic media, the predominant experience of bloodless is that of ghostliness, a kind of unreal half-life. The experience for the viewer is eerily disembodied. Unlike in first-person shooter games, or for that matter, in military simulations, there is no representation of the viewer's limbs or body, and no way for the viewer to affect their surroundings, uh, resulting in a feeling of vulnerability and defenselessness. Um, this feeling of vulnerability is exacerbated by the 360 degree immersive environment in which something could be approaching the viewer from any direction at any time, uh, regardless of where the viewer happens to be looking. So the viewer's experience is that of passive witness, able to sense, see, and hear, but never to impart or intervene. Um, the feeling is that of liminality, of being both present and absent, of being unsure where one ends and another begins, of a profound disruption to the sense of embodied boundaries. So the viewer's ghostliness is mirrored by um, that of Yun, who is apparitional both because we know that she is a representation of an already dead um, and indeed murdered person, but also because the film represents her as somewhat spectral even in life. So her movement through the deserted streets of Dongduchan is noticed by no one and she interacts with no one, underscoring her exceptionality and that of the camp town itself. Um, Bloodless is steeped in the neither here nor there precarity of camp town life. The emptiness of the city is certainly due to the exigencies of covertly filming in an active camp town with no, uh, with no permits, uh, which meant that Kim and her production staff had to film in less trafficked areas and at night um, when streets were more likely to be deserted. Yet by combining this emptiness with the deliberate pacing of the scenes, the kind of icy blue light, um, and the lack of an uh, extra diegetic um, soundtrack, Kim amplifies the solitude into an aesthetic. So in one particularly disconcerting scene, the ghostliness of both the viewer and the figure of Yun comes to a head. Um, and that's actually kind of why I wanted to pause it, but um, I was do not. Um, do, do you want to just see it again? Yeah. OK, yeah. Yeah, so I want you to um, also just pay attention to this last bit where she's looking at you. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Okay, so let me just stop it right there um, because this, this uh, I'm going to talk about this part right now. <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, so in one particularly disconcerting scene, the ghostliness of both the viewer and the figure of Yun comes to a head. The scene opens with the viewer facing a wall in a dark, narrow alleyway. Again, we hear the footsteps approaching, this time from our left. Yen's figure then emerges from the dark, approaching the viewer until she has stopped and is staring at or possibly through the viewer with a serious, unreadable expression on her face, like this expression right here, <laughs> right? Um, so, um, you know, this, this expression is so interesting, you know, because um, it's like, you know, it, it, it's so unreadable. It's like, is it accusatory? Is it, you know, um, anyway. Um, so, uh, diverting our view from Yun um, does not alleviate this discomforting sensation, but in uh, many ways makes the scene even more eerie, as doing so means knowing that, you know, we're still being watched by her. So you don't have to look at her, you can look away because that's like VR, but then like, you know, there's like some, I mean, someone looking at you. <laughs> 
<clears throat> All right. Um, Yan never explicitly acknowledged the viewer, either by gesture or expression, and one is never entirely sure if she sees the viewer or if the viewer is invisible to her, a sense that is unnervingly exacerbated when she continues her journey, which the VR technology makes feel as if she is walking through the viewer. It's so interesting. It really does feel like she's walking through you. Um, so the scene and the manner in which uh, the actor plays Yun is ambiguous. Was there an actual interaction between Yun and the viewer? Was Yun aware that the viewer was even there? Uh, or was the encounter accidental and coincidental? A situation in which the viewer, ghostly um, and apparitional, happened to be in her path. This encounter, which is not an encounter, a scene of questionable recognition. The last scene of the film shifts from this more evocative spectral mode to one more reminiscent um, of the horror genre, interestingly enough. Um, a jump cut finds the viewer in Yun's motel room, a cramped yellowing space. Um, all we um, see at first are the cracks in the walls and a discolored linoleum covered floor, seemingly empty but for Yun's oversized jacket hanging in a corner, a bag of sodas, a full length mirror propped in one corner, and a crumpled blanket strewn along one wall. Footsteps that we now recognize um, as Yun's approach the door from the street and eventually stop right outside but no one enters. Gradually, Depending on when and whether it happens to catch the eye, blood seeps from underneath the blanket, pooling slowly toward where our feet would be. Several beats later, but again, um, depending on when and whether it catches the eye, the dead and violated figure of Yun, crumpled next to the blanket, appears in the reflection in the mirror, but not in the room itself. So the feeling of this scene um, may be akin to those summoned by the conventions of a horror film, a sense of vulnerability, of creeping ominous danger, interrupted by a sudden gruesome shock. At the same time, um, this scene operates on a temporality of contingency because it is entirely possible that the viewer may never have seen Yun's body at all, depending on where the viewer happens to be looking when, when, that, when the body appears in the mirror. And in fact, um, one of the people that I went to see this um, screening with didn't realize until afterwards when um, I and um, you know, the third person that I went to see this screening with um, <clears throat> were talking about, oh my God, the body in the mirror. And she said, the what in the what? <laughs> and she had missed it completely. Yeah, so, um, so um, that the shock of seeing Yun's body is exacerbated, exacerbated by the viewer's realization that one's own movements and decisions um, affected exactly when and whether one saw the image, and that there may actually uh, be no shock, actually, um, because of this condition destabilizes the ethics of witnessing. So Bloodless thus throws, thus throws into crisis the idea that VR enhances ethical decision making. Instead, ethical indeterminacy is the main effect of the film. Uh, so who the viewer is in Bloodless um, is and what our role might be is raised but never answered. Structured by a temporality of contingency rather than resolution, the film explicitly troubles rather than assumes or enhances verisimilitude. It emphasizes rather than undermines the incommensurability of the physical and the virtual. Ghostliness in this film is an embodied feeling as well as a theme, um, triggering a, a feeling of perceptual indeterminacy um, Bloodless attests that trauma is historical memory, manifests in embodied and effective ways, yet suggested, uh, suggests that this manifestation is e uneven, uncertain, and hardly predictable. So in so doing, <coughs> Bloodless gestured to other embodiments, other possibilities, beyond the terrors of killing in the, in the guise of justice. Thank you. Sure, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Okay. 
<laughs> Hello, I can see everyone. Hi, Daphne. <laughs> Hello, Daphne Brooks. <laughs> Say the first part. The corporate oh. film precedent. So, yeah. thinking of like Captain Bigelow's um, Strange Days, mm -hmm. like, it's really a kind of virtual apocalypse, mm -hmm. dystopian mm -hmm. um, interrogations of neoliberal life, and use that kind of destabilizing, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. shifted, ruptured perspective. Yeah. Very, very new. Yeah. Reality. Yeah. Maybe, okay. actually, yeah. you know, so uh, yesterday um, after the graduate seminar, I was sort of talking to some of the grad students and, um, you know, this is the thing about this film, right? Which is that, you know, when you make an argument about something, you're like making an argument, but I, I still have a lot of feelings about this film that are very unresolved, right? And, um, it, you know, and then um, the fact that, you know, I know Gina and then she's like a friend of mine and a colleague and, you know, um, that makes it so that I don't, you know, like being hypercritical of a film that's made by a friend of yours is also a little bit fraught, you know, and, 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 and it's not like I would be hypercritical of this film, but, you know, um, what's really interesting about this film is that, you know, and the way that Gina presents this film is that, like, it's it's very at the same time, like, you know, so it's won a bunch of awards in, like, a kind of, like, elite film festival circuit, right? And these sort of elite, you know, pretty white, you know, um, film festival audiences, like, love this film, right? <laughs> the South Korean folks at the South Korean Women's Film Festival also really liked the film. She was really nervous about it. And she was like, oh my God, what if they hate it? But they really like responded well to it. So, um, and then, you know, um, and I, as I said, you know, Gina is like, uh, like a commercial filmmaker, right? Like she's actually working on TV right now because she doesn't want to travel too much. And she's like, I teach in LA, so I'm going to work on TV. Um, and the way she represents this film is she's just like, like parts, of it, like parts of it are just like, yeah, you know, I sort of didn't want this to be like a kind of memorialization of her. I wanted to destabilize things. But then she's also like, oh, it's so great that this is going to get circulation because it's going to really raise awareness. <laughs> you know? So there's something implicit that I would love for you to draw out. Absolutely. Right. I, I wasn't even going there, but I'm fascinated by that. Mm -hmm. Especially, mm -hmm. um, can you just um, reiterate, there's no music in the film? No, it's no. It's okay. very kind of, you know, like basically the only sound you hear are her footsteps. Mm, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, there's no dialogue. She's sort of alone. Um, I'm trying to remember now if like the dog barks or anything, you know, at the beginning. And now um, I can't. I can't remember. I need to pay more attention to that the next time I see this film. But anyway, it's very. It's it's very like that. There's and the, this music is not at all. Um, Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I don't know how mass the circulation this trailer is actually, because you know, it's it's a, it's like a twelve minute vo vo virtual reality like sort of niche film, you know. So it's uh, it, there's and there's um, but but certainly you know more people have seen this trailer um, than have seen the VR film, you know. Um, so um, and um, yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, um, you know, the, the um, trailer, um, you know, uh, like I think what's interesting about the trailer is that 
it doesn't prepare you at all for watching the yeah. movie in a good way, you know? So, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it, it's not like I'm saying that it's somehow, I mean, in terms of the mood of, that it evokes, I think it's very, you know, resonant. Like, if, if the film were to have music, it would be this music, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's the, this music is the feeling of the film, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. was such a beautiful reading of the form and the um, apparatus as well as the representation in relationship to its origins of production as a military type of mm -hmm. and um, the way in which it um, skews temporality, skews the formation of the so-called ethical decision of whether to shoot or not, mm -hmm. and um, displaces and reorients that. Um, what I what I wanted to ask you to do more was to sure. talk about how it change it changes verisimilitude, and maybe it's because I don't know so much about virtual reality. Mm -hmm. Is it a hyper verisimilitude or or? You know what I mean? For me, I think the way that it challenges verisimilitude is that you're just so ghostly. Mm. You know, it's that disembodied I feeling, see. See. right? Yeah. Um, because um, you know. I mean, there's sort of this way in which you're like, wow, I'm in Tongduchun, but like... The, disem the continual sensation of being disembodied. Yeah, is so disconcerting. Like, it's really hard to explain if you're not in it, you know? Um, and, and there's something, and, and you know, there are other, like a lot of virtual reality things are kind of disembodied in that way because it's just a lot easier to make VR films mm -hmm. that don't have representations of people's bodies, you know, and that aren't um, interactive. Mm -hmm. Right, um, but um, I think there's something about um, the pacing and the mood and the lighting and and um, uh, the abrupt kind of you know cuts from scene to scene that you're constantly feeling a little bit disoriented and that sort of produces this feeling of vulnerability mm -hmm. that like makes that disembodiment feel really palpable, mm -hmm. right? So um, so um, you know for me. Um, you know, uh, the fact that you can kind of look around and see everything uh, didn't actually uh, result in the feeling of like, gee, I'm really there. Uh -huh. It was the feeling of like, oh my God, I'm kind of half there? Do I exist? Do I not exist? Like, who am I? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I think that would be my main, you know. No, this neutrality comes across even in this. Oh, for sure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Grace, this was such an amazing talk. Um, really? And I, I kind of, yeah, it was, it's, it's, everyone's a little stunned, I think. But, oh. Um, but I, I wanted to kind of connect, oh, Daphne's gone, but Daphne's Oh, no, gone. Daphne's right there. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Go, ghostly. Oh, like ghostly. <laughs> 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 then Daphne's question was, oh, it leads us a little bit, which mm. is um, that it, it's, it seems like because the decision was made to make it non-interactive, that the, the virtual experience is primarily uh, still mediated through the optic nerve, like so it's still through the eye. Right, um, right. And so it seems also to be a choice about a commentary on the relationship of the cinematic subject mm -hmm. to your discussion of U.S. empire. Yeah, um, no, that's very the true. contemporary condition mm -hmm. of a kind of, you know, post, post-war consensus uh, mm -hmm. sort of, you know, a neoliberal era mm -hmm. of, ins of global insurgency yeah. and, and virtual technology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so in a way, I wonder if she's, if you have thoughts about how she's trying to critique the, um, the, the, the way that U.S. empire worked under the cinematic order. Yeah, um, in yeah. Which Asian, exactly. Asian object was differentiated from imagined viewer. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah um, to absolutely. To particular order that we're in now under counterinsurgency. Yeah, no, wow. that's absolutely right. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's um, why this trailer doesn't represent No, right, yeah. it really doesn't, and doesn't kind of prepare you for it or anything, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's so many different ways of responding to that. You know, one, I mean, I think, you know, is uh, sort of um, the idea of, um, um, you know, like 
like cinema and VR is a kind of heightened form of cinema. I mean, the VR does share a lot with, I mean, with cinema, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like um, a lot of the VR folks in like new, new media studies and cinema studies, you know, have made the argument, which I think is, is pretty um, compelling that, um, that there is, are as many connections as there are disjunctures between VR cinema and like regular, you know, cinema. Um, <clears throat> So, um, and a part of the, the kind of, um, the, the, the part of the thing of cinema is that it's about sort of um, like uh, seeing, mm -hmm. right? And, um, uh, and, and visuality and then, you know, um, and VR is about um, like the, the uh, uh, kind of uh, presumption that you can see more, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, um, you know, so, so, you know, that's obviously a part of, um, you know, if there's a way of thinking about it, um, uh, you know, if you think about the, what, um, say, like Lisa Yonayama and Neda Tanasovsky and those folks are saying, right, is that this com contemporary moment of U.S. empire is about saying, like, even the critique, like, even the self-critique is going to, like, replicate. Right. And so there's this kind of like uh, expanding totalization of like recognition and redress and and um, like vis visibility and and you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, stabilization. And stable, you know, um, that, um, you know, like as we see with the military applications of VR technology is like entirely wedded in that logic, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so I mean, so the the ways in which, you know, Bloodless really kind of interrupts that in a variety of ways um, through VR technology, but also like through its use of the technology, right? Um, um, sort of troubles that in these different ways. Um, so, um, but the question about um, how that specifically relates to the conditions of like occupation and insurgency um, I'm going to have to think on that a little bit more, you know, like that part of it. Um, but that's a really helpful question um, and like a really productive uh, direction to go with this, I think. Like that I'm going to have to think on a little bit more. Um, so I think Al Alicia had a hand up before and then we'll go to Rod or is that okay? Thank you so much. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Similar context, mm -hmm. a, a militarized context, mm -hmm. um, where there was also, mm -hmm. you know, I was struck by thinking that in the context of representing young dead women in these contexts of yep. military presence, yep. right, there's a distinction between sex worker mm -hmm. as targets of sexual violence mm -hmm. who cannot be liberated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, sex worker. And where this comes up for me is again that in the ethics of this technology of putting the self into the scene, um, that in the context of the military, <coughs> yeah. training, it is um, a peculiarly uh, to imagine um, that a person is going to interact and uh, make a difference in the scene. Yeah. <laughs> I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, that that is a question aspect of the military. Mm. 
I Absolutely. find it also curious that she's can't speak at all and you know mm -hmm. That is such a good set of questions. It's not, that's so not even just one question. <laughs> it's like, like so many questions. No, no, let me try to tease all that out. That was so good. OK, so um, yeah, the first thing is that, you know, yes, of course, like what this does is it makes you so passive, right? And so, you know, um, and um, so there is no opportunity for like uh, either uh, sort of uh, like redemption or or failure for you in this right um except insofar as going back to what chenna was saying the ethics of witnessing right but even that then is undermined because you could just miss it <laughs> you know so i think a part of what that is doing is sort of saying um you know it's just like it's just like it's just not it's indeterminate, it's, it's contingent, it's like the temporality is of contingency, you know, and that there is no kind of um, uh, like, you know, pure sort of moment of, ethic you know, so one thing, right, that I think this particular scene um, does when she kind of walks through you, right, and you're not sure what have you, is um, that it makes it so that it's really clear that you and she cannot interact, right? And because a number of people have asked um, about this who haven't seen this, like, well, could you be the killer? Like, could you be in the, the figure of the killer? And you kind of can't, right? Because like, if you were the killer, why would she walk through you? You know what I mean? Um, so, but, but there's sort of this way in which the, the idea that you're the killer and so you are put in that position and you can feel that guilt and feel complicit and whatever, that is a kind of ethical kind of figuration of a subject where it's just like, oh, then you can feel bad and be like, we're all complicit in the, in the exploitation of sex workers who, you know, there's that, there can be that moment and this film won't let you do that. Right. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, uh, so, uh, um, you know, so so there's that, you know, um, so I mean, I think um, this is also like the the interesting and sort of weird thing about this film that I haven't 100 percent made up my mind on, no matter how like sort of like, you know, in, in the in the sort of the structure of a presentation. I'm just like, this is what I think about the film, but there's lots of things about the film I like, still don't know what I think about. <clears throat> and that is sort of about like, um, about like the function of ethics in this film, right? So I kind of tend to feel like what it's primarily doing is just making you question, <clears throat> right? Like, like, uh, like what, what kind of ethical subject? you can be or you can, you know, what kind of ethical subjectivity you can have, you know, um, but, you know, um, but um, please. No, no, no. no the, I was going to go on to this other thing. And so also maybe it's that, I don't know what I think about this either, but maybe mm -hmm. it's not possible with the virtual reality technology that's produced by the military mm -hmm. to have it prescribe an ethics yeah no absolutely absolutely right um <clears throat> um and so you know and and you know that's part of why she's like well i'm using this t technology to kind of you know this the other thing about this it's so interesting um and god i should i should talk about this <laughs> um is that um so you know one of the things that i don't um uh well okay um, so uh, one of the things that um, that is, um, like I said, kind of unusual about Yun Gumi is that, um, you know, she wasn't the sort of good daughter, right? Um, even though in, in a lot of ways the narrative tried to make her be that after, it, you know, it got... Um, <clears throat> but, but it just became this huge hyper-visible thing that, like, just, you know, um, and it was like a major big deal. Right. Um, so, you know, I said that um, the title of the film is, um, uh, you know, bloodless in English, but the title of the film in Korean is Dongdu-chan, which is the actual name of the camp town. Right. And um, and, you know, that's because like Dongdu-chan means something in South Korea, like people know what that means in part because of Yoon Gumi. 
right? Um, so, I mean, uh, and also it's just this huge camp town and, you know, it's just like kind of a fact of life, but, you know. <clears throat> so, um, so there is that. Um, and so that's really interesting to see. And what Cho and other folks have said is just like, well, you know, um, the, the fact that South Korea, uh, there was this huge sort of mobilization around um, Yun, you know, doesn't necessarily mean that South Korea has somehow, you know, uh, like escaped to like sort of, you know, US neocolonial sort of pressure, whatever. It, it's just a convergence of different kinds of things, right? The, the thing that I was going to talk about, though, was, um, you know, one of the things that I'm not 100% uh, sure about how I feel is that uh, uh, that her, this, like, sort of dead and violated body is represented mm -hmm. at all, right? I mean, and it's in the mirror, and you could maybe not say whatever, but it's there, right? And that's a huge conversation that has been had in a lot of different contexts. And um, I tend to be, myself, of the um, of the perspective of sort of like not representing that, like so for example, one of the things that I deliberately don't do in this presentation and you know is describe how she was tortured and raped and violated, right? Because it was pretty uh, graph like, and if you read about her, um, not Cho, but other people who have written about her are pretty graphic, right? About and, um, and from the beginning, I was just like, yeah, no, I'm not going to do that, right? So, the, and, um, so there's sort of this way in which, you know, Gina, uh, uh, may, having made this decision to represent this, uh, this kind of battered body, right, is one of those moments where I'm just like, oh, Gina, what were you doing, right? But on the other hand, this is the part that's so interesting and, you know, help me with this. Um, so what had happened was, because this was sort of this whole thing, there were these photographs, right, of um, the motel room and her body and whatnot that circulated everywhere, mm. right, in newspapers and what have you. And Gina was um, a part of a group of Korean and Korean diasporic feminists who, uh, like, basically worked to get that scrubbed. So if you uh, type in Yungumi into Google, that image no longer circulates, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so it's not like she, she, she doesn't have a simple relationship to this idea of like, no, like all images must be free, like let them circulate, like quite the opposite. Like she's not a kind of like, we can't censor images, like film can't be censored, not at all. She's just like, censor this crap, you know? <clears throat> so, um, so, um, you know, so that, the sort of representation of her in the film, right? Um, I don't know. It's, it's complicated, right? Um, and that's all I actually have, that's as far as I've gotten in terms of theorization. Like, it's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, in, it's interesting, though. Um, so, Rod, did you have a yeah, hand sure. before um, and then Kimberly? You know, one of the things that's so interesting to me is that not the film, but the military use of VR mm. tries to recover the ground as the site of ethical um, mm. you know, war. Mm. And what's so interesting about that is I used to teach this book called um, The Dream of Civilized Warfare about the World War mm. One mm. And the reason the book argues that the flying aces came into being is because there was a battle of World War One. Um, where the bodies were just, you know, you know, uh, the dead were just massive, in massive numbers, mm -hmm. and the carnage was so graphic that they, the military decided to take war to the air, mm. um, and through that construct the idea of the gentleman mm. warrior mm -hmm. you know, who could produce a clean war, mm -hmm. right? Mm. And so you would just have aerial war. Um, and, you know, of course, the Vietnam War um, disrupted all of that. Yeah. And what's so interesting is that the military then goes to VR to kind of recover. Yeah, to the, recuperate that to idea. To recuperate, you know, the ethics of ground war, mm -hmm. to make it precise, mm -hmm. to make it clean. Mm -hmm. But then the film, you know, uses uh, the character Young to disrupt even that. You mm -hmm. know, that, that 
it doesn't matter if it's aerial war or ground war. Mm -hmm. It is all unethical. Yeah, yeah. No. Basically, and and you know, and also, I mean, um, you know, Catherine Moon's um, Catherine Moon's uh, book is called um, Sex Among Allies. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and it's like so that's also this thing that this does, which is like, you know, a U.S. Army medic. Right. A medic. Right. Who is in like his job is ostensibly to like save people's lives. Right. Um, kills this kills this woman really brutally. Right. And in that um, and in that sort of like, you know, training simulation. Right? Like, she's the ally, right? She's not the enemy, right? And so this, this context is very much about, yeah, like how the, the violence of militarism, like, does not um, discriminate, actually, right? Like, exactly in that way, right? Like, the IITs, like, you know, we can train you to be really good at this. And it's just like, no, you don't even have to be, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so thank you. I will look at that book, <laughs> um, Kimberly, and then later. So much for this talk. It's really rich. Um, the question that I have is about. You said that Kim attempted to produce this film several times. Yes. So what was she thinking about before the VR? I'm assuming that VR wasn't a part of that. No. 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 Okay. So yeah. Was she thinking along the lines of just like, like a short? Film. You know, it's about the same length, but no, um, you know, she um, she said that she tried like multiple times, like she would try you know, and she would she, uh, uh, you know, I can't remember 100 percent. She was just like she was like, maybe I'll do a documentary, you know, maybe I'll write a feature film. Right. Maybe I'll you know, and she said she kept trying and just just completely kept not being able to do it. And then she was just like and then I thought VR. And then I was just able to do it. Yeah, like she found out about VR, figured out how to do VR, like super cheap, right? She uh, strapped like 10 GoPro cameras onto a pole, right? Um, and then filmed everything. Um, and then filming took two weeks, but post-production stitching it all together took like months. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah, so so it, she tried for for decades, right? Like, because you know this was this happened when she was in college, right? And then she kind of became a filmmaker and made all these lots of films, um, and throughout she just kept wanting to make a project about this, um, and she just kind of found that they all stalled out, and then she's just like, well, what about VR? And then it just happened. That's how she represents it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The lighting, the especially green, a kind of green lighting. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I didn't realize she was using GoPros. Mm -hmm. So has she talked a little bit, and can you talk a little bit more about some of the aesthetic choices, kind of going back to Alicia's question in terms of how that intersects with maybe the ethics of... Yeah, yeah. No, it's really true. So. Um, you know, I haven't talked to her about um, sort of the aesthetic choices of this, but you know, it's not unlike a lot of her other. Uh, her, she's just a very beautiful filmmaker, right? Like her yeah. films are just very, very beautiful, and this is a really beautiful film, right. right? And so, yeah, that is that is the question, right? And it's also a very um, kind of indie film kind of beautiful right like the 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 um the um the way that you know scenes are composed and and you know shots are framed and things like that you know um so um so um that is really interesting right um because um uh because these scenes are very very beautiful um and so that's also a question like are you aestheticizing this of context, you know, are you, you know, and yeah, it's totally, you know, arguable that you are, I mean, this, this makes this camp town look beautiful and 
you know, I've never actually been in a camp town because that's not like the kind of place you just kind of wander into, but I highly doubt that it's like good looking. <laughs> you know what I mean, um, but, um, you know, so, um, and, and that's just like, because, you know, Gina is this very, it, like in, a, in all these different ways, she's like very elite, you know, um, she's, you know, trained in a certain way, uh, like she, you know, has a certain kind of aesthetic, right? Um, and this kind of, um, um, like there's like, uh, there is this kind of greenishness to this particular scene, but a, a lot of the scenes are um, in this and in other things are kind of this icy, blue, clean, aestheticized feeling, you know? Um, so there is definitely that. What's really interesting is that that last scene in the motel room, um, it's like the overall aesthetic feel of it is just kind of dinginess. It's like very yellow, you know, everything's really yellow. And, um, you know, so, I mean, a lot of this is very kind of exigencies of filming the way she, that she did. So I don't want to say that that was necessarily, um, deliberate, right? I mean, the room that she used is ac an actual motel room that is being used currently for sex work. And, um, and she, um, speaking of verisimilitude though, what is so weird is that in some ways she's so invested in that idea. And she talks about how she, uh, and her production staff, um, got the exact kind of linoleum they used to use like in 1990 or like an older version and like scarred it up and made it look old and re linoleum that. It's so weird. I don't know what to do with that either. Um, so, uh, um, and uh, so that, that, so, you know, that uh, room, um, she, you know, made um, both was kind of battered looking and dingy and she also made, you know, battered looking and dingy. Um, and then the lighting, I imagine, was not 100% in her control you know, um, so, um, so that is, you know, uh, much less aestheticized than, uh, or in a different way than this, right? Um, so, um, so yeah, there are lots of things about that, you know, the, there are lots of things about this film, and that's, I think, a part of why um, I'm interested in looking at it, um, that, you know, can sort of cannot be sort of read as like, yeah, sticking it to the man or whatever, you know, um, for lack of a better term. I have to come up with a better term than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, so I think of course. Thank you. Um, my question is more speculative, but I'm sure. Yeah. Another way of sort of imprisoning representation. So Absolutely. I was just thinking about like part of what was shocking when you were talking about the scene of mm -hmm. the hotel room, even if one were to miss it, is that it's so like primed the viewer for a particular kind of Absolutely. response to mm -hmm. like a very visible horror trope of like seeing something in the mirror or like mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so glad you raised that because that's the thing about the horror part of it. That's really interesting. Um, so, um, you know, uh, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, when I first saw it, which was like very, very early, you know, um, there was a very early screening of this at UCLA because that's where she teaches. And, you know, we um, went to see it and um, <clears throat> and um, afterwards we were like, oh, my God, that was a horror film. Right. Um, and, and, you know, and I was, you know, like Googling this film just to sort of and like there's some, you know, one of the first things that comes up is like Gina Kim's horror film, Bloodless, <laughs> you know, so people really recognize it that way. Um, you know, um, I, so, um, I actually want to reference the work of a, a grad student of mine at UCLA, who's actually working on, um, the horror genre, um, as a kind of, um, uh, like the kind of um, like affect of uh, sort of white 
um, like you know white nationalism in the you know um, post World War II era. Um, and one thing that I think is really interesting about the horror genre, and yes, I mean the horror genre it does a lot of containment, right? But what I think is really interesting about the horror genre, which I think is also a part of of um, what's happening in general here, because there's a whole other part of this um, that I've written out that's about um, the undermining of empathy, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, this can be thought of as like an issue film, right? And when she says, oh, this will raise awareness, right? That's placing it in the trajectory of like the issue film. Right. Like and so there's this kind of tradition of documentary filmmaking that comes out of um, like 60s and 70s that are about like, oh, um, you know, um, like third world newsreel or, you know, about sort of taking up um, documentary filmmaking um, as a way of like, you know, like as a uh, an, uh, as like a part of like these kind of social movement you know, um, interventions into kind of cinema, right? And that has kind of also morphed into like social documentary and the issue film and that, like this particular like film festival crowd, right? Like that's kind of the audience for that. Like you feel good about going and watching this and you're just like, oh wow, the plight of the blah, 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 right? VR, right, has been called the ultimate empathy machine. It's this very, yeah, it's, that's like kind of a cliche in new media studies about like VR being called the ultimate empathy, um, empathy machine. So um, a lot of VR, um, uh, sort of the way that, the, that VR is um, used, right? Um, there's a huge genre of VR that's um, like, so for example, the New York Times did this VR film about um, like being a migrant like on a boat in the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. right? And a refugee. And you're like, you're the refugee. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. So that, that's like a whole genre of film, right? Um, so, um, uh, and especially VR film. So there's this military application, there's the gaming application. In some ways, like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like the gaming applications are so, some of the like least interesting, um, it, even though it's like some of the biggest. And then there's like this whole kind of like appar educational apparatus, you know, uh, sort of, you know, genre of VR film. And that's entirely operating on empathy, right? The idea of VR is the ultimate empathy machine. Like, you're going to go, oh my gosh, there was a VR film about uh, being um, uh, uh, so much about migrants and refugees, like crossing the US Mexico border, like in the desert, <laughs> right? So um, there's this part of that. And what I think is really interesting, so my um, student, Stephanie Chang, who's working on horror, one of her arguments is that horror um, is a genre that does not operate on the register of empathy, right? Um, so, um, you know, uh, like it's, it's actually kind of like against the kind of sentimental melodrama or the, you know, it's a genre that is like completely uh, sort of um, like cr critical, right? of um, and, you know, refuses empathy, right? So in some ways, I'm, I wonder if like the use of kind of horror as a trope um, can be seen as a way of displacing the ultimate empathy machine. I mean, like so much of this, like the fact that you're disembodied, the fact that you, you know, like don't, you know, whatever, um, um, like has these kind of empathy displacing um, you know, the fact that she walks through you or whatever has all of these sort of empathy displacing um, uh, tendencies, I feel like, you know, but but yeah, I mean, the thing about the sort of making people anticipate the whatever, um, I mean, there is definitely that, but then there's also the fact that you can totally just miss it, you know, so, and it's really hard to write about because it's like, it, even on the sentence level, where you're like, it does this, but it might not. <laughs> you know? So anyway, um, mm -hmm.
Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Right, and the linoleum. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, uh, I don't know like what she thought, who that she thought the viewer was going to be, or like, you know, what have you. You know, um, and uh, you know, um, and and. You know, what she says is, like I said, she, like, you know, whenever I ask her, like, oh, hey, like, I'm going to, you know, give this talk at Yale. And, like, if it turns out that they have a VR lab, like, you know, can, can you know, whatever. She's always like, yes, yes, of course, you know, like, like you know, and it's just like, well, you know, thank you so much for working on this. Like, every, you know, whatever, like, it'll spread awareness, you know, <laughs> she'll say things like that, right? So, I mean, there's sort of this way in which she just wants everyone to see it. She just wants everyone to see it. You know, um, uh, you know, and, and she, of course, because she's this professional filmmaker with many, many credits and who just knows, she knows that it's only going to be screened at film festivals and universities and museums and other places where there are these, you know, yeah. So, um, you know, so that is kind of the inherent limitations of VR, like as a medium right now, because it's like, you know, yeah, there are all sorts of, um, people with VR headsets, but let's, like the gamers aren't going <laughs> to want to see this. They're obviously not the audience, you know? So, um, so yeah, yeah. Um, You mean this um, rep with this yeah. this version of VR? Yeah. Does that um, sort of um, yeah, yeah? I mean, I would say um, yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, so I mean, um, but you know, I think you know what um, uh, what it would sort of say, like what I think Bloodless and Cho are kind of saying. Um, Cho for sure, bloodless, you know, in some ways yes, in some ways not, but like what they're both kind of saying is that, um, uh, that, you know, the point to reckoning with trauma is not resolution, right? The point to reckoning with, or the point to dealing with PTSD um, in whatever therapy, 
therapeutic or military applications is to resolve it or to cure it or to fix it, right? And what I think, you know, what um, Cho would say is like, you know, um, you know, uh, that trauma itself or the manifestations of this trauma, including like say bloodless, like I would think of this bloodless, the film itself as a kind of manifestation of a kind of historical trauma, right? Um, that in and of itself um, is, isn't a resolution, right? Like it's not a cure, you know? Um, but that it's important for these things to, I mean, not just important, but they just will exist. Mm -hmm you know, and the more you try to cure it or the more you try to say, we've redressed this injustice, we've put this guy in, in jail, right? Or, or like we've imprisoned this person or we've, you know, like, you know, um, we, we can fix it. We can, we have the technology, we can rebuild him or whatever. Um, you know, uh, you know, like more, the more, the more the ghosts are, are going to come, like the ghosts have agency. Right? Because of that. Yeah. 